الإسلام ديني ومحمدا رسول الله ويقيني أدنو إليه ساجدا بجبيني اقبل صلاة الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. We have learned a lot. الحمد لله giving دعوة collectively for the last few decades in this land. And I want to begin by actually talking a little bit about uh, my own experiences. So I grew up uh, in the 80s. And the first exposure I had to quote-unquote da'wah was none other than Ahmad Didat and the Didat videos, which I'm sure many of us in this audience uh, are very familiar with. And alhamdulillah, I even met uh, Sheikh Didat a few times, and no doubt he was a, a type of, of influence um, on me. At the same time, watching Sheikh Didat's videos gave us a type of presumption about da'wah that I think needs to be corrected in hindsight. He did a great job. May Allah bless and reward him. But a lot has happened since 1985. And we have been collectively giving da'wah in this part of the world for almost a generation now. And the impression that we had, the impression that I had definitely, and I know I speak on behalf of many people, was that all that we needed to do was to have a strong personality, good debate skills, and solid arguments. If you had solid arguments and you could take on these Jimmy Swagarts and all of these other people out there, then the whole world will convert to Islam once they hear of your solid arguments. And if we could only go to a training school by Sheikh Didat and come out mini replicas quoting you know, scripture and whatnot, then all of mankind would convert. But you see, in my particular case, I actually did go to study at university. You start giving da'wah, and you realize that no one converts. You preach and you teach, you talk and you give lectures. Months, years go by, and the people that you're talking to, by and large, they don't convert because of your da'wah. They don't convert because of your solid arguments. In fact, the people who convert have nothing to do with you. They come because they're interested in something else, and they track you down, not the other way around. And they knock doors on your masjid, and they say, such and such happened, I'm interested in Islam. Now that they're this close, then you come into the picture and you speak to them a week, a month, and then inshallah ta'ala, you give them the shahada. But it wasn't your didad arguments that converted them. It wasn't your solid, you know, two-second clips that you memorized because you attended the Saturday Ikna workshop with Shaykh Yasir Qadi that had nothing to do with it. Rather, they're already intrigued. They're already curious for something else. And then they come to you with a different mindset. And I think that we need to, it's about time. And again, I mean, uh, this, is, this is the first time I'm also teaching something to this frankness. But I think that it is time that we move beyond the platitudes, be, move beyond the cliched responses and got to some real psychological issues of da'wah. Because the fact of the matter, dear Muslims who are attending a da'wah workshop, if solid arguments and good personality were enough to convince the world of the truth of Islam, the Quraysh would have been convinced of the Prophet as soon as the Prophet opened his mouth with the kalima. But was that the case? If all you need was to attend a training workshop and to be spoon-fed the right answer and to have the solid argument, could anybody be better than our Prophet wasallam? If all you needed was to have a good hujjah, Ibrahim salam had the best hujjah, وَحَاجَّهُ قَوْمُهُ And did his people convert after Ibrahim's hujjah? It did not happen. And therefore, we need to actually have a very, very frank reorientation about how we're giving da'wah and what is the best mechanism for giving da'wah. And remember that even our Prophet wasallam, it took him 23 years of constant preaching. And even then, it wasn't his arguments that won the Quraysh over at the end of the day. It was the political conquest of Mecca. 
It was the political conquest of Mecca that eventually caused the leadership of the Quraysh and the people of Mecca en masse. And ironically, dear brothers and sisters, even at the conquest of Mecca, those leaders converted grudgingly. They did not do so willingly. Abu Sufyan to the very end and those other leaders, it wasn't an immediate acceptance. And when they converted, they were in a gray area for a while, period of time, as the books of Sirah mention. And it took a while. Even Allah mentions those who converted that, at that time. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman has not yet entered your hearts. So if converting people and giving da'wah was as easy as memorizing two second responses to the shubuhat, to the arguments that come, then the whole world would have been Muslim for 14 centuries. We need to get rid of this mindset because what happens is, my dear brothers and sisters, when we have this simplistic mindset, what happens is when we start giving da'wah and nothing happens, at the very least, our own gets deflated. Like, what's going on? Why aren't people coming to Islam? I'm saying what I was taught to say. These are the responses I was, I was, I was told. It will dampen our own enthusiasm, our spirit to give da'wah. So we need to be very, very frank here. Strong arguments by themselves will never win converts. Solid logic in and of itself will never gain hundreds or thousands of people converting to Islam. There is only a very, very small segment of mankind where intellectual arguments works with them. A very small slither of mankind. And those people are already searching for the truth. They're already looking for answers. And they're typically coming to you, not the other way around. They're already in a mindset where they're wanting to search for the truth. And tell me honestly, what percentage of mankind are that courageous and brave that they're willing to break away from their tradition and they're trying to find the higher values of truth in other traditions? It's a very, very small group of open-minded, intellectually courageous people who are willing to think through everything. We also need to be aware of some of the psychological problems of uh, giving da'wah to others. I'm going to mention two or three primary issues that we should all be aware of because we don't want to dampen our own spirit. We don't want to astaghfirullah even harm our own iman. And I have met people, a'udhu billah, that they have given da'wah for decades or years and then they get so frustrated that they even just lose track of religiosity. They just stop doing anything because what they thought would be useful, they didn't see the impact of what they thought would be useful. They had a different mindset coming in. So I want us to be aware of some of the psychological issues when we give da'wah. And by the way, we are coming to the siro. Don't worry, it's going to be here. But I find it highly problematic. And if you want me to teach you, I'm not going to just jump to the specific because in my humble opinion, that wouldn't be doing the topic justice. I would not be doing the topic or you justice by ignoring this uh, simplistic mindset. So I want us to be aware of certain psychological problems that we as da'is face when we're giving da'wah to our people. The biggest problem that is mentioned in the Quran and our psychologists fully understand the ter technical term for it or the, or the mass term for it is groupthink. Groupthink. This is the biggest problem. And it is a technical psychological term, groupthink. You can call it social conditioning. Groupthink is when you are born and raised in a group, you will think like the group. It's very simple, right? When you're born and raised in a group, you will think like the group. And you will assume that that group's relative orientation, standards, mechanisms, mannerisms, culture, theology, everything that you associate with your own group, that is automatically the default. That is where you begin looking at the whole world through the lens of your own group that you have happened to be born and raised amongst. So, psychologically, this is well known, and that's why the Quran mentions every group said the same thing to their prophets. Who are you? Our fathers did this. Our culture did this. Who do you think you guys are? Right? And 
I have given many talks about modernism and progressive Islam and whatnot, and the same issue applies to us having been born and raised in this culture. We absorb the values of this culture. Our second generation, third generation, they absorb the values of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and they think this is the default. Those of us that have lived through that, we understand and we see these changes going on. So the point is that we need to be cognizant of this issue called groupthink and understand it is very, very, very difficult to persuade someone to break away from the group. And in fact, the fact of the matter, at some level, we are all guilty of groupthink, even in the most innocent or the most innocuous manifestations. And I'm going to give you some examples to make us understand. If something as trivial as even accents we find strange, we make fun of, the fact of the matter, and I'm guilty of this as well, we make fun of people's accents who speak English different than us, right? People in Canada, about, they say, right? The British and how much we can say about the British accents, what not. We all find it funny. And yet at some level, isn't it childish for any one group to find another group's accents funny? We all are like, huh, you say this, you say that. Words of the same thing, right? I can give you, again, because I've raised, been raised in a British environment and have many British friends, you know, what we call a stroller for the child, they call, who knows? No. What do they call a stroller for the child? They, that's old British, but modern. Push chair. You're laughing. That's exactly my point. You find it funny. When I said to them, we call it a stroller, what do you think they did? They laughed as well. It's fun. A stroller, stroll in the park, stroller. Now, what, why am I giving these simplistic examples? Every one of us is, quote unquote, guilty of groupthink here. Like we are tickled, we're amused at something we have never been exposed to. Even though it's as innocuous as a pronunciation or a word in the English language. What we dress as, right? I mean, Westerners find the thobe to be bizarre. That's a dress, that's a skirt, right? And for us, we wear thobes all the time. And in fact, not just this, but even amongst the Muslim culture. And again, don't want to put anybody on the spot or whatnot. I'll tell you my own. Let me just say myself, right? Even the type of thobe you wear. So over here, you wear a thobe that's half sleeve and spotted and whatnot. And you come and you lead the salah or I'll lead the salah. Nobody will bat an eyelid. In Arabia, in Saudi, when I was there for 10 years, right? That is the thobe you wear when you go to sleep. That's the pajama thobe. And when I first got to Medina, I mean, we don't even, in this country in America, we have no clue, right? When I got to Medina, I would wear that thobe to the, to the masjid until somebody pulled me aside and said, um, why are you wearing this in the masjid? I was like, what do you mean? It's a thobe. I mean, it's an Islamic garb, right? You know, the thobe you're wearing, for example. Put you right on the spot there, okay? And most of the thobes that we wear, this is a pajama equivalent in Saudi Nobody wears this in public. It's embarrassing to wear in public, right? But over here, you can lead the salah, give the khutbah, and you have honor over here. Oh, you are, mashallah, dressed Islamically. If I wear jeans and this, I can't give the khutbah, they're going to kick me out. But if I wear a half sleeve thobe, they kick me out in Saudi and not over here. Why am I bringing these examples? If all of us are guilty of these things, do you think when it comes to big issues like theology, we can understand them because of an intellectual argument? I'm trying to express to you how difficult it is for a human being to break away from the construct they happen to be born and raised in, to break away from the social norms, from the values that they happen to be raised in. And I can keep on giving example after example. The most, one of the simplest examples, public displays of affection, PDA, between couples and spouses, and these days between anything else. But anyway, so between couples and spouses, right? In our, mashallah, Muslim, Desi, Arab culture, right? You don't do anything with your spouse in public. You don't even hold the pinky finger like this at this distance. That's considered aib. That's considered astaghfirullah, tawbah, tawbah, astaghfirullah, right? You can hold the hand of your best friend, male friend, and jog along the park this way. And nobody would bat an eyelid. Now you do the exact opposite in this culture, correct? In this culture, you can do much more with your significant other and it's considered decent, no problem. Whereas if you hold hands with a guy, well, then people think other things about you, right? Again, what, all of this is to make us understand, do you really think a two-minute argument 
to defend our religion is going to make sense to somebody born outside of it, we need to get rid of this mindset from our own minds. We need to be more mature about da'wah and understand you can't just spoon feed somebody in two seconds. It's like trying to explain to somebody your, your, these uh, you know, relatively trivial differences. Try to explain to them in two minutes. It's not going to work. How do you think you're going to explain the seerah and the problematic issues of the seerah and morality and culture of the Prophet in a two minute clip it's simply not going to happen so the first thing to be aware of is group think the second thing to be aware of is something that psychologists have called in group bias in group bias in group bias basically means and again we're all guilty of it these are things there's nothing wrong with it it's human beings do this in group bias as the term applies implies of, uh, pr- refers to the fact that you are always biased towards your own group and you make excuses for your own group and you look positively at your own group versus those who are outside of it and again there's nothing wrong with this it is human nature that what your group does if the same thing were to be done by somebody outside you would problematize it But when it's done by your side, your people, your group, in your minds, you find a justification, right? Now, why is this important? Because we are the other when it comes to this society. And things that our religion has done or the Prophet has done or has happened in the Sahaba's time, this is not in-group bias. We have in-group bias when we look at those things. We find an easy justification from our paradigm. It makes sense. But realize, if the same things had happened against us, we would have not found justification for those things. And there's nothing wrong with this. It's human nature. In group bias, you do it. And the point is that whoever you identify with, you will always look at in a more sympathetic light. And whoever you think of as the other, as outside of you, you don't identify it. You will dismiss, you will criticize, you will exaggerate. And I think the most obvious example for this in our times is the issue of terrorism and the tactics of terrorism and the counter tactics of terrorism. This whole debate for the last 15 years, we as the Muslim community have been put in such an awkward position because outsiders don't understand what is going on in our side of the world. We don't agree with the tactics of those terrorists, but we understand why what they're doing, they're doing it. But the people outside don't even understand that. And when they do even worse to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Syria, they don't see that they're doing anything wrong. This is called in-group bias. When they do Guantanamo, when they do invasion, when they do if this and that, for them, oh, but they did 9-11. Oh, but they, everything is justified. This is in-group bias. You make a million excuses for your own, right? And everything that your group does, it just falls into place naturally. Oh, but that's, we couldn't help it. It's self-defense. Those guided missiles, those drones. I mean, what do you expect us to do? Oh, but if they do a drone on us, or if they do more than this, oh, ha, that's terrorism. You know, that's you know, the, the, the classic issue of defining terrorism. And I've, I have a whole class I teach, uh, used to teach at Rhodes about terrorism and, and whatnot. And we go into academic detail. Uh, and again, let's forget... Uh, Muslim terrorism because it gets very awkward <laughs> speaking about that. Let's talk about something everybody, everybody else should be aware of. The IRA in the 80s and 90s versus the United Kingdom. The IRA, the Irish Republican Army, right? The Irish Re- Re- Republican Army was uh, a group that is deemed terrorist by the British government. In the 80s and 90s, in the 70s actually, it declared war against the United Kingdom. And their list of grievances went pages and pages and pages, dating back to 1550. No exaggeration. The Irish and the British did not get along, if you don't know, for a long period of time. Colonialism and plundering and raping and pillaging. So there's a long list of grievances that the IRA have. And in after World War II, the IRA say, enough is enough. We're going to fight for our freedom. And anyone who's above the age of 35, you guys probably have no clue, there were bombs being set off in London year after year anytime there was a bomb muslims didn't even bat an eyelid we know we're not guilty for those bombs everybody knew who's doing the bombs in london who's doing the bombs in across england who's doing it ira 
Now you ask the IRA, and they're like, this is justified because of all that they have done. The irony here in America, the IRA was a legitimate organization. Some of our main congressmen and senators now were actually members of the IRA. And they would raise funds for the IRA. And this is well known, and they don't even deny it. Because from their perspective, this is legitimate resistance. And when the IRA was asked about these terrorism tactics, they would always on you know, blatant uh, um, you know, television, they would justify, say, hey, you're doing much worse to us. This is a war of independence that we are fighting against you guys. And um, when I took a class with Tony Blair, if you remember my article that I wrote, I actually brought this up with Tony Blair directly, the double standards of the IRA and the quote-unquote you know, Muslim terrorists or Islamic terrorists out there. The point being, if we can understand one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, the simple adage, if we can understand this and we see it constantly, we need to understand whether we like it or not. Some of the tactics that we know in our textbooks, we're looking at it from one side of the aisle, and the other guys are looking at it from the other side of the aisle. You're not going to be able to justify or contextualize. It really depends on who do you sympathize with. What side do you consider yourself to be a part of? If you're Irish, even if you don't agree with the tactics of the IRA, overall you're more sympathetic to them than you are to the other side. Because you know what they've done to your people, right? And so even if you say, oh, they shouldn't have put a bomb in central London, but... And then you go on with that but, right? Whereas the other side, they're not looking at those grievances. And they're like, oh, these people were killed. And you cannot bring the British and the Irish to fully agree on those tactics that happened in the 70s, 80s, and, and early 90s, right? It's not going to happen. If you can't get two people of the same skin color and the same Christian religion to understand, do you really think you're going to get a brown-skinned Muslim from the Middle East or Pakistan and somebody from, to really understand the tactics of 1,400 years ago. We have to be pragmatic and realistic and stop telling ourselves fairy tales. You cannot be taught a two-minute response that will sol solidly refute some of the issues of our seerah against those who criticize it. If you can't even have a Westerner understand the IRA, do you think they're going to understand something 1,500 years ago in a different place and time, and in particular, different religion and different system altogether? And again, all of this needs to be done because such is life. This is politics. That's war. Just like the IRA has its views and whatnot, and the other side has its views, that's what happens when you're fighting a battle. And in the end of the day, like I said, it really does depend on which side you're looking at and where your sympathies and loyalties lie. Our own country, the United States of America, it justifies everything that it does in the name of tactics. It justifies everything as morally correct. And we all feel very ambivalent about that because we know it's not correct. What do you think most of our people here feel? So my point is, the reason I began all of this moving on to the issues of, of, of the Prophet and, and the seerah, is that I really want us to understand, to stop being told these fairy tales of, of, of whatnot, because it's not going to work. I need to be frank and bluntly honest with you. It is totally impossible to defend each and every accusation against the seerah in two-minute sound bites. Anybody who tells you otherwise, with my utmost respect, is in a fairy tale land. I'm not trying to be too harsh, but this is the reality. It is impossible to be spoon fed and to be taught to memorize nice little packets of information that you think once you debate with a non Muslim, no matter who comes your way, now that you've taken Sheikh Yasuq all these class or if Ahmed Didat were alive or Zakir Naik tells you chapter number 22, then immediately you're going to go and khalas, give him the right and knock him out. Life doesn't work that way. And if anybody were to have done that, our Prophet would have been the most successful in that way. My dear Muslim brothers and sisters, there is a reason why the political strength of Islam followed the ideological and theological conversion. If you understand what I'm saying, if you don't, then think about it. There is a reason why the borders of the Muslim world today are essentially the borders of the Umayyad and Abbasid and Ottoman empires. Groupthink. When groupthink is positive, it's great. You want to keep it that way. Excellent. When groupthink is for Allah and His Messenger, alhamdulillah, it's great. When groupthink is the opposite, it's a problem.
It really is a problem. It's a problem for us. It's a problem for our children. It's a problem for da'wah. And by the way, please don't quote me Malaysia and Maldives and whatnot. Please don't say, oh, look at those. Because firstly, they were exceptions. And secondly, do you know how those exceptions occurred? How did Malaysia become a Muslim land? How did the Maldives become a Muslim land without the political dominion of Islam, you know, get what I'm saying here, reaching them? How? Do you know? I'm asking you. Yes. Trading. That's what they teach you in Sunday school. MashaAllah. Your whole knowledge of Islam comes from Sunday school. Oh, high school Sunday school. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Excellent. Their rulers converted to Islam. When their rulers converted to Islam, the people were essentially socially forced to follow. Sometimes politically, by the way, but socially forced to follow. Even Malaysia and these other nether regions of the world, the conversion, it is, yes, you're technically right. We're only taught, as usual, Sunday school does teach you these, these positives that help us. But again, if you listen to my lectures, you realize, and maybe I'm being overly cynical, but my dear brothers and sisters, because of the internet, we don't have the luxury to be in our beautiful bubble anymore. Because of the internet, I am strongly against ignoring the bigger problems out there and just teaching these half Sunday school myths because maybe because of who I am, but I have experienced too much disenfranchisement from the next generation. I have talked to too many people who have left the faith of our own children and they say to me, we were taught lies, we were taught truths. It's not correct what we were taught. And I therefore, because of all of this, you will not hear me. Maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe you're used to other types of philosophies and all the best for them. But if you want me to teach you as, as you have asked me to teach you, you're going to hear me blunt and raw. This is who I am. It doesn't work, my dear brothers and sisters. Nobody can teach you these little snippets that you will then become super da'wah man. doesn't work that way. The fact of the matter, da'wah is a very, very, very dry and tough field. And most of the people who convert, they already are interested in conversion. They just need the fine tuning. They come to you by and large. Or, and we're going to come to this as well, that, uh, well, before I get there, so let's talk about this. So we talked about uh, two issues. The third issue here, um, uh, the psychological issue, and that is, what do you, and there is no term for it, I'm just going to explain the phenomenon here. What is our perception of the seerah versus their perception of the seerah? When I ask the average Muslim, when I talk to the average Muslim and I say to them, describe for me the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or I ask the average Muslim, tell me your top five incidents from the seerah. What do you think they're thinking about? All of you, you yourselves think about them. Describe the Prophet ﷺ. You're thinking of his mercy, of his smile, of how he was loved to the Sahaba, of, of, of. When you look, talk about the incidents of the seerah, you're going to think about the ta'if one and how he withstood it. You're going to think about Mecca and how he forgave. And alhamdulillah for that. That's who we are. But we need to be intelligent enough to understand when we give da'wah to other people. Do you think that is the image they have of the seerah? See, here's the point. We have a disconnect. Our narrative of the Prophet ﷺ, our image of our Prophet is totally disconnected from their image. Completely disconnected. They have been taught. Now, let's ignore the lies. Okay? Let's imagine there's an educated man amongst them. Even though there are usually a lot of lies, you know what? Actually, these days is half truths. It's not even lies. Maybe a hundred years ago would have been majority lies. I would say these days, public awareness has increased to the level that everything they know about our Prophet ﷺ, it's not an outright lie. It is they've chosen this, that, this, that. Oh, the massacre of Banu Qurayza, they said, right? Or married to this many women. Or, and they construct an image of a person we don't even recognize. But when you go and look at what made that image, Point after point. A lot of times these points are valid, right? It's just a matter of 
what do you emphasize how do you construct the image versus how do they construct the image so when you look at it it's as if we're talking about two different entirely disconnected characters our image of the prophet versus their image and for now let's assume their image is based out of half truths let's say that there's no lies amongst them which is not rare, neither is it common. But let's just suppose that everything they have, it comes straight from our seerah, straight from Ibn Hisham. They could construct an image that is so radically different from ours and yet still based upon our books and our tradition. So do you really think then that a two-second clip out of one of those issues is going to solve all of the problems? Now they could, are, we will say, oh, their image is distorted. We will say, you've only chosen those aspects. How will they respond to us? What will they say to us? Why do those aspects even exist? Number one, why do those aspects even exist? Number two, you've also picked and choosed. Exactly, right? You see, we have to be intellectually honest enough to say this, right? They will say to us, firstly, even if we chose these 10 points, why do these 10 points exist? They're problematic. You are telling us he is rahmatan lil alameen. You are telling us he is qudwa. You are telling us he is the role model. Well, if he's a role model, even if it's 10% of his life, explain that 10%. And isn't that a valid understanding from their perspective, right? And then the flip side, we say to them, you're biased. They say back in return, so are you. You've also picked and choosed your issues and you've ignored these ones. So my point with all of this and... Again, maybe because of who I am, but I can't sugarcoat this. I have to be brutally honest with you because I want you to understand da'wah is not so simple. You go knocking on doors, you preach to them, give them a pamphlet, and then they're going to convert. We've done this, been there, done that. I did this when I was 17 years old in Houston, and now I'm in my fort. It doesn't work. And if anybody tells you otherwise, I'm sorry, but they're lying to you or they're mis mistaken or whatever. Da'wah, generally speaking, is a dry field. Now, does that mean we don't do it? No, we're getting there. We still must do it. And we still have to learn these arguments. And we still have to preach and teach them. But I want us to have a better understanding because I don't want you to burn out. I don't want you to have unrealistic expectations. When you don't find those expectations, whose iman is going to suffer? Not theirs yours you're the one that's gonna burn out and say oh my god what happened why isn't it working is it me is it this no that is human nature so when they have constructed this negative image of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have such a positive image the fact of the matter is listen to this carefully and i know it's a cliche term but it is so true we have completely different paradigms from looking at the seerah completely different paradigms the way we look at the seerah versus the way they look at the seerah and even if we learn to respond to every one of their negatives they bring forth 10 negatives because of their paradigm once we respond to those 10 they'll bring another 10 and another 10 and another 10 you're gonna go down a rabbit's hole that has no ending to it and I want us to keep in mind the incident of Isra wal Mi'raj and how it was interpreted by Abu Bakr and how it was interpreted by the rest of the Quraysh. The incident of Isra wa Miraj, we all know what happened. It was bizarre, atypical. It's something that, how can anybody go to Jerusalem and come back? When Abu Bakr heard it, radiallahu an, he's coming from one paradigm. So what does he say? Of course it happened. Siddiq. And when everybody else heard it, they rejected it. You cannot intellectually defend and logically rationalize something like this. It's a totally different paradigm. Do you think Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's best logical response could have converted anybody? No. It's a totally different paradigm. So, before I get to the actual points of the seerah, again, all of this is preliminary, so we understand and contextualize. Our primary goal in da'wah, my dear brothers and sisters, should not be to be able to memorize these two-minute sound bites, these three-minute clips that we can respond to with these deep-seated questions. No, listen to this carefully. 
and I apologize if this comes off as too, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I don't know the previous classes you attended. I don't know the previous next you're going to do. I have a very different philosophy when it comes to ta'wah. Very different philosophy. And so, take it or leave it. Listen, I have my views. Listen to them. If you disagree with them, no problem. Throw them out the window. And Talha won't send you the PDF. And if you agree with them or benefit, then alhamdulillah. I have a very different view of da'wah overall. In my humble opinion, da'wah is not primarily done via the tongue, via intellectual arguments, via solid, logical, rational debate. It doesn't done that way. It's not done that way. I was impacted by didat. Zakir and I, is somebody I consider to be a friend. I was with him many, many times. But the brutal fact of the matter is those tactics did not convert hundreds and thousands of people. That's just the fact. What it did was it reaffirmed our iman. We loved didat more than those outside of our faith. It affirmed our iman. It made us strong in our faith. But the fact of the matter is it didn't convert a lot of people. On the contrary, to be brutally honest, that mannerisms actually turned a lot of people off if you knew what was going on back in the 80s or not. So we need to overcome this issue of da'wah being an intellectual exercise, of da'wah being a rational argument of knowing how to respond to these debates. No, on the contrary, conversion to another faith is not usually an intellectual process, it is a psychological one. It is an emotional one. When you convert, it's not generally speaking because of a deep-seated philosophical debate that you had with somebody else. Not at all. Look around you. Who converts in our own community? The number one group of converts are those married to Muslims. That's the number one group. And in the beginning, Iman might be weak amongst them, but slowly but surely, when they're exposed to the community, then it will increase. The number two group are those who, they're searching for a higher truth. They are in themselves, they're not satisfied with what's going on in the world. And for example, prisoners is an example of this. Why prisoners? Because they've been cut off from any other source of of, of, of entertainment so they're forced between four cells to think of other things they're forced to reevaluate their, their lives when they're forced to do that now they're wondering what am I doing here what went wrong is there a higher power and so now they're in a different wavelength and then you obviously have the few the very few who are intellectually brave in their own cultures and communities they're not satisfied with their religions they're not satisfied with the status quo and they're wanting to find the truth they're the ones going to the internet searching what does buddhism what is nirvana what exactly does this mean you know what is the enlightenment you know other versions of christianity eventually they cross other things till they get to islam and and then something clicks and the fitra kicks in. Or it might be a psychological issue. Psychological. They meet a Muslim at work. Man, this guy is intriguing, man. He's got this peace coming from him. Where did that come from? This person seems so calm. His manners. This, this akhlaq. The, the, the sakina, the haiba. Or one of my friends went to a, a tourism as a non-Muslim. Went to Muslim lands. And he was just impressed at overall the generosity and the karam and the hospitality. And he's like, why are these people so different from us? Why do these people have, now this is back in the 70s, so much kindness <laughs> back then. Things have changed, but so much kindness, you know. Why are they always inviting a stranger to their house? What, what is this about them? Why do they do that? Oh, this is Allah commanded us. Really? Your God commanded you to treat the stranger with kindness? What happened here? Was this a deep-seated intellectual debate? Were they spoon-fed the two-second clip in Sheikh Yasir Qadi's Ikna Da'wah seminar? Or was it a raw, spiritual, psychological exposure? See, this is what da'wah is. Much more than just that two-minute clip. You being your authentic self, you look at the early converts. You look at the Sahaba. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq didn't need rational arguments. He knew the process them to be true. See, that's what you call iman. Because of what? The akhlaq, the love, the kindness. Much more important than these highfalutin debates and, and whatnot. Much more important. Your impact at the human level, at the individual level. Your, the, 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 raw iman that you're exuding 
One of the most famous, you know, American converts in the 70s. What's his name? Subhanallah. Jeffrey Lang. Even Angels Ask, the famous one, right? Read his biography. Read his biography, the one he converted. 1978, University of Kansas, right? Professor of mathematics, super smart, whatever. And intellectually, he's at a different level. Spiritually, he's zero. Spiritually, he's empty. And he's wondering, what do I do, what do I do? He goes to the various student organizations on campus. He doesn't like Catholics, right? Not that it doesn't work. And his autobiography says, I walked into the MSA's office not knowing anything about Islam. He has no idea what Islam is, right? And I spoke to this brother, the big beard terrified me. Even in the 70s, big beards terrify. You know, big beard exudes, mashallah, yani, masculinity and whatnot. So the big beard terrified me. But I asked him what his faith was. And he says, I mean, I don't remember the wording. Don't, don't you know, look up his, he wrote it better than I am saying. But he basically said, the sense of spiritual certainty this young man had, even though I was double his age, I felt jealous. Why can't I have that spiritual certainty? Why can't I feel that way about a higher power the way this young man does about his God? In fact, if I remember, he didn't even say the response the man gave, which goes back to my point. It wasn't the deeply rooted, logical, philosophical, rational argument as much as it was, my God, this guy... He knows the truth and he's happy in it. That raw psychological impact of meeting a genuine mu'min, that was what sparked his curiosity and said, this religion is something different, you know? I mean, and again, I have so many stories from my own life experiences meeting all these converts. When I was in Medina, one of the most bizarre converts, I remember, bizarre meaning the story wise and what, a very interesting couple. A French couple, yani Caucasian French, in their late 60s. And they had converted in the 70s and they were living in Medina. Medina has some really interesting people in it, right? So this is a French couple. And their English was broken and spoke with a strong accent, you know. So they're like, you know, what not. So I was asking him his conversion story. And again, it's the smallest things that spark it off. He told me he was born agnostic, atheist, couldn't care about religion. But he is working in whatever it was, I think, where Jeddah, whatever he was working back in the 70s. No, not Jeddah, sorry, it wasn't Saibir. Another Muslim land, I forgot where it was, right? And, and he said that the adhan was called and he was shopping in the souq at the time. It wasn't Jeddah because it wasn't the law of the land. Remember now, it wasn't the law that you had to close the shop. It was just the people. So the adhan was called. And it was his first week in the land. And he saw, that's a beautiful adhan. Then everybody around him began shutting the stores, one after the other. Shutting the stores and closing shop. And he looked at the watch, it's 4 o'clock. He's asking, why are you closing shop? It's only 4 p.m. And they said, oh, we have to go pray. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Just wait. He said... That was the first time Iman entered his heart. Like, what type of religion is this? That people will leave their rizq, leave their money, close their shop, go and pray to their God and come back? He goes, the first time I ever thought of religion when I saw that. And I said, if there's any religion true, this is what a religion should be able to do. Right? Again, was it some deep-seated intellectual argument? So again, why am I beginning with all of this? Because frankly, I don't believe that this is the proper way to be given 10 questions and 10 responses and memorize them and go forth and go door to door. No, it doesn't work that way. And if you feel this way, you will be sorely disappointed. Da'wah is primarily through akhlaq and amal and not through preaching, not through your tongue. Da'wah is by your one-on-one -on -one interactions with the people. And they'll see something in you that reminds them of a higher purpose, that demonstrates to them that they're empty inside. Something's not right. In their own fitra is going to click. Then they will come to you with a different paradigm. They're willing to become an Abu Bakr paradigm. That's the point. If they're not on Abu Bakr's paradigm, if they're on Abu Lahab's paradigm, you can answer every question they have. They're going to bring another 10 questions and you're going to be back to square one. It's not going to work that way. This is why for me, that was a very, very different uh, thing. So, as I said, historically speaking, the vast majority of converts that converted across the globe, it was because of groupthink. 
your people are converting, you're going to convert as well. Well, that's not going to happen by and large in this land unless Allah wills a miracle, but that is atypical. That has never happened in human history, as far as I know, where people just converted en masse by themselves. Always it was either the political dominion or their rulers. And essentially it's, that's another type of political dominion, right? And by the way, this is why I myself, I never sugarcoat the political expansion of Islam. It's ludicrous to do so. Listen to my seerah. Listen to my, when I talked about Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu and the wars of expansion. And I go into this detail. Was Islam expanded by the sword? And I'm very frank. This is not the time to go into there. But because of my experiences, I never sugarcoat. I never give you a, a, a romantic romanticized view and then the truth is other than that because it doesn't work that way we would not be here today as Muslims if Muhammad ibn Qasim and Amr ibn al-As didn't go and want to conquer Hind and Egypt for reasons that were no threat to Islam we thank Allah that ibn Qasim came to our lands I thank Allah that Islam came through political means and that's what we you know we have to be blunt about now it's not going to happen in this land anytime soon, which means the fact of the matter is conversion will be very, very slow, trickle down, which is what it is happening. And it's going to be at the individual level, which is what it is happening. And it's going to be because of raw actions by and large. That's why we need to understand what we need to do when we interact with the broader public. We need to bring about that paradigm shift one-on-one, -on -one, not en masse. We need to spark something in the other person around us. They need to witness something in our own lives, whether it is how we treat our family, whether it is our sakina, whether anything. I mean, it is a million things that can happen but by and large this is what we're going to uh, bank on now does that mean that there is no point in bringing up these questions of the seerah and then answering them obviously not obviously not we will do that don't worry inshallah ta'ala we're going to do that but the point is that we need to be pragmatic the primary reason for bringing up these problematic issues from the seerah and then teaching you the responses, the primary reason, actually, believe it or not, is not for da'wah to non-Muslims, but to reaffirm the faith of our own Muslim men and women. Because those born and raised in these lands, they have heard the same issues that we're going to be discussing now. And their iman is not as strong as the iman of some of us born and raised back home because of group think, which is a positive thing. Nothing wrong with that, right? The average Muslim who comes from Egypt, from Pakistan, from Timbuktu, when they come here, they've been raised a Muslim. They're strong in their iman. Then they hear these things. Their image of the Prophet is so different, they just disconnect from these. Ah, that's not the Prophet I know. Just disconnected. It. it doesn't affect him. It's like impervious. But you see, my children and your children, some of you in this audience, you don't have that strong iman that came because of group think, that came because of society, that came because you're living in the lands of Islam. Now you are struggling with this issue. Why did our Prophet kill 750 people at the Banu Qurayda? Why did this man who's a role model marry 11 women? Why, why? And your iman, generically speaking, might not be that strong as the iman of your father and mother. And you really do need some validation. Your paradigm is sympathetic to that of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, but it's not quite at that level. So to answer those people more than to answer outside of our faith, we do need to answer all of these questions one by one. These intellectual arguments come more in handy within the tradition than they do outside of the tradition. right? And then, yes, there is the rare odd, exceptional, non-Muslim, definitely atypical, who is already on the fence for whatever reason. They have already got to that level for whatever reason, and now they just want these last issues answered. So then, yes, it will also come in handy. But the point is, a person who is not sympathetic to the paradigm of Islam will not be convinced of his paradigms because of these answers. It's not going to happen. The same issue comes for bigger problems. For example, the classic example, and it's a bit of a tangent, but you should be aware of this. Those who don't believe in God, the number one problem, the number one theological problem that non-believers have in God is the existence of evil. Okay? The number one problem. Why do people reject God? There was a tsunami wave that killed that innocent child. 
how could a God allow pain and suffering? My second cousin died as a child. What did he ever do? That's the main problem. Now, Christians, Muslims, Jews, anyone who believes in God will have enough answers that satisfies them in their own paradigm. Correct? All of us have enough answers that satisfy us in our own paradigm. We have already gotten to that level of Iman where once we say, Insha'Allah, in the Akhirah, this is going to happen. Allah will give shafa'ah, reward. We say, Alhamdulillah, it works. Now, you tell me. Those same arguments, will they work for the atheist? Yes or no? No. This is what I'm trying to say with these arguments from the seerah that we're going to present in our next session. Do you understand what I'm saying here? This is what I'm trying to say. When we get to these arguments about the seerah issues, right? We need to be brave enough to be frank. We need to be brave enough to be very clear about this. That, look... The fact of the matter is these arguments will only help when you've already set up the paradigm. You're already sympathetic somewhat. When will you get sympathetic somewhat? Not because of these arguments. These arguments are not going to be the ones that will cause you to come forward. It's going to be something else. What will that something else be? As we said, there are many issues that come. But generally speaking, it is a psychological and spiritual issue, not an intellectual one that causes that conversion to happen. And subhanAllah, here at our Masjid and Epic, subhanAllah, I mean, those of you that are coming here, you know regularly. In the last few months, we've had three conversions. You know this. One of our security staff and two of our cleaners. Three people have converted in our own masjid. What was different about them? Do you want to know something? Not one of them was approached intellectually with da'wah. Not one of them was handed a pamphlet. Not one of them was shoved, you know, some material. Say, go read this. Not one of them. But what was it? Hmm? Just seeing the community. Looking at what a peaceful community this is. What an amazing brotherly, spirit, sisterly bonds here. They see the realities of what's going on and they're like, man, this is amazing. I want to be a part of it. And now when they convert, they are already sympathetic to the Abu Bakr paradigm. They're sympathetic to... What, and so if the non-Muslim comes and says, how could you convert? That is a prophet of war. These same people will defend our Prophet even though they've never been spoon-fed these responses. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at, brothers and sisters, right? Okay? I hope I haven't frightened any of you or like any... I mean, I don't know, maybe Ikna won't invite me ever again. I don't know. It's like, it's like, I mean, I'm just giving you my opinion. And by the way, I could be wrong. You know, I mean, this is my perception, but this is my experience and whatnot. And, 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 and I believe that it's better to be frank than, than to be, you know, uh, in a different manner. In any case, uh, what, I, what I do right now, inshallah, it's 3.20. few minutes for Q&A, five minutes, and then we'll give you the first break. Then come back. And then, yes, we will do the questions that uh, we had from the seerah. But after this long introduction, so that inshallah we are, at least you understand my wavelength, that's all. At I don't know, I'm not going to say we're on the same wavelength. Maybe Talha is going to write me off and put a PDF online against me tomorrow. But until then, inshallah, we can do it. Any quick questions about what I've just said? Yes, brother, in the back. go ahead. I cannot hear you, brother. You're going to have to raise your hand. Where does the Qur'an fit in this paradigm? So the Qur'an is of course the ultimate mu'jiza, the ultimate miracle. And the Qur'an, subhanAllah, the same thing would apply here to be honest. If a person has zero intellectual sympathy to change from their own paradigm, it is very possible that even the book of Allah will have minimal impact on him. Like the book of Allah did not immediately impact the Quraysh, even though they understood the language and they knew how beautiful it was. But their group think was so strong, right? W w Walid uh, uh, ibn Uqba, uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Abu Jahl, they appreciated the beauty of the Quran, but they still rejected it. How much more so when that beauty of Arabic is lost in the English translation? So once again, I would say, this does go back to that paradigm shift. Are these people willing to explore a different paradigm? If they are, the Qur'an can be brought in. Now for some people, the Qur'an will impact them immediately. That's great. And so definitely, uh, the Qur'an is something that 
you know, is, is useful to have. In, in my humble opinion, though, this is my personal opinion, I, I believe that the Quran should not be given out en masse to the people. This is my humble opinion. They should only be given at second stage. My father is wanting to say something, so go ahead. Yes, Abhi Boli. Uh, we'll, inshallah, we'll see after the, the class where now is the, the break. Inshallah, we'll see. So the point being, I, I think that the, the, the mass distribution of the Quran, just to give it out to people, I personally am against to for multiple reasons. If anything, I think a selection of the Quran should be given. A selection of the Quran, not the whole Quran. You should give them 10 pages of various belief in God, belief in the Prophet. This is better at an individual level to be given. But still, there should be a paradigm shift. You need to have that open-mindedness to want to be able to, to get to that level of paradigm. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Okay? Sisters, any question from the sisters? No question? Yes, go ahead, sister. Go ahead. So our sister says that our actions will inevitably seem strange to Muslims. Of course, our hijab, our rituals. Allah says in the Quran, when they see you pray, they think it's a joke, right? They think it's a joke when you pray. It's natural. Like I explained, we find people's accents funny. You don't think they're going to find our rituals funny? It's the way human beings are. At some level, we need to understand and sympathize and empathize. At the other level, we need to keep on... So this is a deeper topic. Maybe one day we should talk about this. Actually, if you ever want to invite me again, please invite me about the fitrah. This is my suggestion to the ikna organizers. The fitrah is what we need to talk about when it comes to da'wah. What we need to do is to tap into their fitrah. That's what we need to do. What we need to do, the hidden tool that we have, not the tool, the hidden weapon that we have is the weapon of the fitrah. That fitrah is what we need to understand. The psychology of the fitrah is what we need to be taught in da'wah. Because the fitrah is a gift Allah has given us to preach our religion. The other person, the other side, their fitrah will be empty. Their fitrah will be searching for something. Our goal is to tap into their fitrah. That's the goal of da'wah. And all of these stories of spiritual emptiness and conversion and whatnot, essentially what happens is the fitrah of the other person recognizes the beauty of Islam. So they might find something funny, like our hijab or whatnot, but given enough time, the fitrah can be covered. That's why a kafir is called kafir, because kufr means to cover up. You all should know this. Kufr means to cover up. What is covered up? The fitrah. Our da'wah is meant to scratch that covering. Our da'wah is meant to uncover the fitrah. If we have the pure fitrah uncovered and they see the purity of Islam, halas, we've done our job. In fact, that is the paradigm shift. I wish I had said this before, but it was a different topic. I mean, but Jazakallah for asking the question. I reiterate, we talked about the paradigm shift. How do we get the paradigm shift? The paradigm shift is to tap into their fitrah. The fitrah is our secret weapon that Allah has given us. Everybody has a fitrah. Everybody. Islam and the fitrah are like the opposites of a magnet. They attract one another. Islam and the fitrah, they are like the opposites of the magnet. The problem comes, their fitrah is covered up. And our Islam is covered up because of how far we are from Islam. Their fitrah is covered up because of culture, because of their religion, because our Prophet ﷺ said, every child is born upon the fitrah, then what happens? The father and mother, the parents, the culture, they make him a Jewish person, Nasrani person, Majusi person. So their fitrah is covered up. A lot of times our iman is covered up. How will there be that attraction? So we need to be pure Muslims. That's why I said, this is, I would say 1% of da'wah. But anyway, let's say 10% of da'wah. Okay, all of this intellectual stuff, 1% to 10% of da'wah. 90 to 99% of da'wah is us essentially exuding raw iman, being ourselves, our akhlaq, what Islam teaches us to be. And something is going to spark in them. And that's why every single conversion story amongst non-Muslims is different. 
Because the conversion story isn't why they converted. The conversion story is when their fitrah discovered Islam. Whether it was the clinging of the shops closing because of the adhan. Or it was watching somebody's sincerity of iman. Whatever it was, these conversion stories aren't why they converted. The conversion stories only tell us when did his fitrah see the beauty of Islam for the first time. That's what the conversion story is. So we need to understand, we don't know how much corrupted their fitrah is. We don't know what aspect of the fitrah will first recognize the truth of Islam. Could be anything. So because of that, we need to be as good Muslims we can so that something of Islam will appeal to them because in the end of the day if their pure fitra sees the pure Islam khalas we've done our job and the rest is in their hands right that's a very good question sister I hope that answers it inshallah back to the brothers and is good brothers good number one issue not the only thing number one How, how do we understand that groupthink is not enough for our own children, you mean? Well, how do we understand this? Because their groupthink is not... So the question is, how come our own children are leaving the faith and not groupthink within our own faith? Because their group is not just the masjid-going Muslims anymore, is it? Right? Their group is the internet. Their group is their agnostic friends. Their group is, is HBO and Bill Maher. Their group is, you know, Sam Harrison. Their group is these other people out there. That's their group. Twitter and Facebook is more of their group than the Sunday school. So I would say it's because of groupthink that they are doubting Islam. But their group is not our faith anymore. Their group is those other people out there. And when everybody is saying, these are myths, these are lies, these are fairy tales, then he's going to be affected by that. And he'll absorb that groupthink over our groupthink. And that's why, like I said, and again, all of you know this, brothers and sisters, there's a marked difference between a Muslim who comes from a land of Islam and hears these things for the first time versus a Muslim who was born and raised here. Generally speaking, a Muslim who's only been around Muslims, generally speaking, doesn't really listen to these other interpretations of Islam. He just dismisses it because that's not the Islam he recognizes. His whole experience of Muslims has been very different, right? And so when somebody says to him, the Banu Quraida, he might even say, no, no, this never happened. You're a liar. He's never read the seerah, right? Never happened. That's not true. Or he has something else in mind. Whereas our young minds, now, by the way, this doesn't mean that I'm saying we should all go live in Muslim lands because because of the internet, it's all one village now. Even back home, that is innocence is going by the way anybody who doubts this I think you need to get a reality check even back home agnosticism and atheism is on the rise and it's all one big village now but still there is no denying being raised in a Muslim culture and that's why if you listen to my talks one of the things I always advocate to families be careful who are your family friends be careful who you socialize with be careful who you invite over for dinner and who you goes ho whose house you go to for dinner. That is our group think. Your children being raised around practicing Muslims is subconsciously going to impact them positively, inshallah ta'ala. This is our group think. Whether it's not intellect, it's just a matter of their absorbing the lived reality of Islam more than just the intellectual arguments. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa amnu wa lahamma ba'd. So now we get to part two where we mention specific points. And as we said, for the small group of people that actually will be open-minded enough to understand these issues and they want a rationalization and they're already sympathetic to that rationalization. This is the group that it is most effective in. Now, am I saying it's never going to be effective outside? Obviously not. There's always exceptions. All I'm saying though the paradigm shift between these two groups of people, the Muslim who wants to learn or the non-Muslim who's open-minded versus the one who's absorbed in his or her culture. What I'm, my point is these types of responses typically only work in paradigm A, not paradigm B. It's not your fault. 
It's not because these arguments are weak. It's because human nature is such that because of what we just said, all of these three psychological points, and they're more than that, that people's minds, their mind frames, their paradigms are set up differently. And so no matter what you say, it doesn't matter. If you're Irish, you will sympathize with the IRA. It doesn't matter. If you're British, you're not going to, unless and until you really have a radical paradigm shift. So with this caveat in mind, I also want to stress, and I know all of you know this. I know all of you know this. But I want to make sure it's made it clear. Be careful, dear Muslims, of ever, ever, ever saying something about our faith because you're embarrassed, you change it. Be careful. You would rather somebody reject the faith because of a truth than you say a falsehood and you lie about the faith. And they say, oh, okay, that's fine. And then they convert, and then a'udhu billah, they find out they've been lied to. Remember, you are a salesperson for the religion. You're not the owner of it. The owner is up there. You do not have the right to change the product. You do not have the right to alter what is being marketed. You can use different tactics. You can use that, but you cannot lie about the product. It's not yours to lie about. You are not the owner. إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغِ وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَابِ Your job is to convey. Allah's job is to judge. If they don't like something about Islam, you may try to rationalize, you may try to explain. You are never, ever allowed because you're embarrassed, because you're like, oh, that's not true. Oh, Islam doesn't say that. That's not your job. You, have no, you are lying about Allah Azza wa Jal if you say this. If they bring something from the seerah that you find and he finds problematic, you can't just say, well, that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it's not your job to do that. If he or she will reject our Prophet because he or she doesn't understand something from the seerah, you have done nothing wrong. Don't blame yourself. You did nothing wrong. You're preaching the truth. Now, does it mean that you must always bring up everything awkward from the seerah? Obviously not. You must preach the truth. You don't always have to preach the whole truth. This is wisdom. You must preach the truth. Whatever you say must be true. This is the principle I live by. Those of you who take advanced class with me, you know this as well. That, okay, you speak to, the level, speak to the people at their level. But at every level, what you say must be factually correct. So that when they go to a higher level, they can look and they can say, oh, okay, I see what you were saying. Now I see you're elaborating. There cannot be a conflict. There cannot be a contradiction. Or else you have lied about the religion of Allah. And it is not your job to lie about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that, let us begin. Um, the organizers uh, emailed me a list of, of common issues. And so I'll go over them. I have eight issues in total. I combined two of them. They gave me nine. I combined two of them into one because it's essentially the same thing. And I want... This is going to be a joint effort and we'll write it all down together. It's going to be a joint effort because in the end of the day, here's another point, another issue. Not every answer works with every person even if they're open-minded. This is not mathematics. It's an art, not a science. Responding to these arguments is an art, not a science. What do I mean by that? In science, in mathematics, in physics, there's always one correct answer. Generally speaking, in Newtonian physics, there's always one correct answer. In art, that's not the case. In the humanities, that is not the case. It's a very different, very different world. The arguments that you need to make are from the humanities, not from the sciences. And what that means is that sometimes what I might be saying is at a totally different level than the person needs. And somebody comes along, gives a very simple answer, and that answer is much more effective for that person than anything I could have thought of. So there is no one right answer, even when you get to that paradigm. The first, the first contradiction, not contradiction, the first objection or the accusation is that the Prophet wasallam they say, he copied the message from the previous prophets and previous scriptures. They say he took this from the Old and New Testament. And again, I'll give you three, four, five responses. You'll help me out here. And you can try which one works best in which gathering. There's no, there's no right answer. 
of the most obvious responses for this is in fact we psychologically say of course he did what's wrong with that he's from the same line of prophets you just pull the rug out from under them and you say yes he did and that proves he's from the same line of prophets rather than taking this as a negative this is a positive that a person now here you bring in the miracle and this is a miracle by the way this is clearly a miracle that is mentioned in the Quran the fact that a person who didn't have an education and could not read and write and was living in a culture far disconnected from the Judeo-Christian culture of the time is able to bring forth that culture in Arabia in vivid detail is itself a miracle and the Quran mentions this miracle in no less than three or four verses Allah mentions this as a miracle can anybody quote me any verse about this? any verse in the Quran? yes brother in the back close but no prize because I'm talking about a verse that mentions the miracle as being its conformity with previous as being that it is mentioning the stories of other nations so what you're talking about is the fact that he was not educated and he came forth with the Quran that is a separate miracle and that is valid and we can use that point but I'm talking about the accusation is not that he was uneducated the accusation is he's taking from the Judeo-Christian tradition and the response is of course he is and that's the exact miracle not because he took from them but the Judeo-Christian tradition and Islam comes from the same source so what you say is this is the technical term the common origin theory all three of them originate from one source not that he took laterally no the three of them took from one source not that there was a lateral you know taking from the Judeo-Christian the common origin all three have a common origin any verse that mentions this yes so all of the, that's one of them that you can say, but there's a more explicit than this. Still not a prize, by the way, but at least you got something that we give you the best of all stories. Any other ayah? Where are the Hufad? In the uh, uh, this is about the language, not about the stories. Close, but still not it. Which is? That's what he said, the brother in the back. This is about education. He mentioned Surah Yusuf. That is good. You can use that. It doesn't mention stories. But it mentions the Quran is musaddiqa lima bayna Of the verses, you guys aren't mentioning sisters, any attempt? Of the verses is the famous verse, وَمَا كُنْتَ بِجَانِبِ الْغَرْبِيِّ إِذْ قَضَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ أَمْرَ وَمَا كُنْتَ مِنَ الشَّاهِدِينَ You were not there when Allah spoke to Musa. You were not a witness when what happened at Tur. Right? Rather, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to you. Of them is Zakaria. Allah is giving you the story from the private chamber in Masjid al-Aqsa that nobody witnessed. And Allah is saying, you were not there when they argued over Maryam. You were not there when they threw lots to see who would take care of Maryam. How did you know this, Ya Rasulullah? Right? How did you know this? And there's a third verse as well. Uh, there's a third verse as well. My mind is very tired. It's been a long day for me. I have two lectures. I have another one in the evening as well. Uh, I have to do online. There's a third verse as well. مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ هَذَا O Hufad, you're a Hafid. What's before it? مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ قَبْلِ هَذَا Louder. تِلْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الْغَيْبِ نُوحِيهَا إِلَيْك this is from the knowledge of the unseen that we said, say to you, مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ هَذَا Neither you nor your people knew these stories before. Because the context is the stories. Allah is talking about the stories of the previous office. Then Allah says, these are the stories we inspire to you. Neither you nor your people knew of them before we gave them. Now, 
The example that I've given in other lectures is as follows. Imagine before the internet era, before the telephone era, imagine a hundred years ago, we discovered a tribe in South America, cut off from all of civilization, living isolated. And there was a wise man amongst them who had recorded the histories of the emperors of Rome in the 7th century. Talking about the Chinese civilization, talking about the ancient Indus Valley and Harappa and what happened in that time frame. We would say, how did this guy get all of this information? Especially if he's uneducated, especially if he's illiterate. Where did this knowledge come from? His people have no access to all of this. And here is this man. This would be a miracle, the likes of which would drive all of us crazy. We thank Allah we don't have to deal with such miracles. It's only one such miracle. Our Prophet wasallam. Right? So they say he took from the Judeo-Christian sources. Psychologically, we flip it around. We say, of course he did. That's the whole miracle. How could he have done this? Then you mentioned facts that you should all know. There was no Arabic Bible at this time. There was no Arabic. The first Arabic Bible was written over a hundred years after the coming of Islam. The Bible was not in Arabic. And the Prophet couldn't even forget Arabic. I mean, forget Hebrew. He couldn't even read Arabic. There was no rabbinical school in all of Arabia. In Mecca, there was no Christian or Jew that he got it from. And how therefore could he have gotten all of these stories? This is a miracle that the Quran itself actually considers to be a miracle. Now, so we, we flip it around, we say the common origin theory, and we also say that, and I have mentioned this as well a number of times in, in other things that I've said, there's some very interesting stories that are found in the Quran that were unknown to most Jews and Christians up until recently. Up until recently. And the most interesting one is the story of Jesus and the birds. Any converts here from Christianity? Any converts from Christianity? Any converts? Not a single convert from Christianity in the whole class. Okay. I was going to ask where does the story of Jesus and the birds occur in the New Testament? You know Isa ibn Maryam, right? He blew it and it came. In the Quran, we all read it, right? I was going to ask, where is this story found? The response is, it's not found anywhere in the New Testament. It doesn't exist in the New Testament. It's not there. And for the longest time, Christians were scratching their head, making fun of the Quran. What type of, what type of tale is this? Where do you get this from? It's not in our scriptures. It's not in the New Testament. No New Testament scripture has the story of Jesus and the birds. 150 years ago in Egypt, a Bedouin was digging in his backyard or whatever. And in his dig, he came across an ancient mummy. And the mummy was wrapped up uh, in a Christian garb, not the ancient Egyptian garb. And within him were scrolls. And this guy... Uh, sold these scrolls on the black market to get some money and they were discovered to be the lost infancy gospels of St. Thomas a pseudo cryptic one of the gospels that didn't make its way to the canonized New Testament Right? the New Testament has four canonized books the canonization was a process that occurred uh, over the course of after Constantine in the course of 200 years a number of good books have been written about the canonization of the Bible um, and uh, anyway that's a totally separate tangent altogether but uh, back to my story here only a hundred years ago this story was rediscovered there is an actual story in Christian heritage of Jesus causing clay birds to become alive and the Quran has it 14 centuries ago and western world only discovered it 100 years ago where did this come from it's a very interesting point the same goes with Judo, uh, with Jewish sources as well there's a lot of stuff about that uh, including Dhul Qarnayn and others that these are وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذُلْ Qarnain, right modern Judaism has lost Dhul Qarnayn's story currently we've discovered that there was a group of people that actually had a story very similar to the Qarnayn and the Quran has it. So again, there are a number, this is advanced studies and whatnot. And by the way, free plug here, sorry. But the, at the Islamic seminary, we're teaching a class on the Quran, advanced Quranic studies. And we're doing some of this stuff in that class. So inshallah, maybe some of you should register for that free plug. Sorry, Ikna, but I just wanted to plug that over there. Okay, now, first point was what? The issue of 
foreign sources and whatnot, we say, yes, that's exactly the point. This is the miracle. And there are stories in the Quran that are not found in previous. And this, in fact, proves the validity of Islam. The second thing, the second question that was emailed to me. And by the way, there will be time at the end if there are other questions you can ask them. The second question. How do you explain and is it true that the Prophet ﷺ allowed the companions to raid and loot the caravans? Was raiding something that was allowed? Did they raid and loot the caravans of Quraysh? This is a common accusation that is made by modern critics of Islam. What is the response? He raided only the Quraysh. Okay, he wanted to attack the supply lines of Quraysh. Hmm? So the Quraysh were the ones who expelled them and took over their properties. In other words, all these responses are right. We simply say that, of course he did. That's what you do when your people kill you, persecute you, torture you. And we give, and here's another point. We learned this from the Sirah, we learned this from the Quran. This is common sense as well. Whenever you give da'wah, try to give examples from their culture that they will understand. Don't give examples from foreign or ours or whatnot. Go to their worldview. Talking about groupthink and in breed being biased and whatnot, you give examples they will understand. And of the most obvious examples, the founding fathers, did they not raid and loot the king's uh, supply line here What was the Boston Tea Party What did they do What did the founding fathers of this country do Whose property did they destroy You see when you put it in their paradigm Say well that's what our founding fathers in Medina did What's wrong with that Or uh, You can say World War II And the French resistance The French resistance against the Germans All of you should know that Germany conquered France in World War II. Hitler's forces invaded France and conquered France. Hitler ruled over Paris for so many years. And the local Parisians divided into two camps. One group sided with the Nazis. One group went with the Nazis. And the other group went underground and became the resistance, la resistance, the resistance. It was led, of course, by the way, there's one of my infamous tangents we're going down there, but I'm going to hold myself back. Who was the general that became world famous and eventually became the most hero? Huh? Exactly, Charles de Gaulle, then the airport's named after him, became the president, right? That was the general that because of what, just like Eisenhower back then. So Charles de Gaulle, this, your world history class came in handy, mashallah, talha, good for you, alhamdulillah. So my point is that the resistance, what did the resistance do? Did they throw flowers at the Nazis? What did they do? They attacked the supply lines. That's exactly what they did. They went underground. It's a war. What do you do in war? Simple as that. You don't have to sugarcoat it. Of course they did. What did you expect them to do? That's what exa If you wanted to win and they won in the end and because they're winning we are all here, that's what you're going to do. That's... Everybody does that. No, no problem there. So did the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba raid the caravans of the, 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 the Quraysh? Of course they did. Why is there to be embarrassed about? They, the Quraysh did much worse. And this was a defense mechanism against the, uh, uh, the Quraysh. Okay, so that's... Yes, go ahead. So this notion, this is a very good question our sister is saying, isn't Islam meant to be a spiritual religion above these political issues? And the response is, this is a very deep question, much deeper than our time allows. The person who asks you this has betrayed a psyche of modern Western culture that goes back to this notion of render unto Caesars what is Caesars, render unto God's what is God's. This is not coming from Judaism. It's not coming from Islam. It's coming from Western culture whose paradigm was 
Jesus, and Jesus, by and large, did not challenge the Roman Empire. Right? So, that faction of Christianity views its spiritual leaders as being apolitical. And this is a deeper question altogether. And therefore, when politics and religion were intertwined, for that culture, those were the dark ages. They looked down to it. And they were the dark ages. You know what happened. Martin Luther comes along and throws the tyranny away. Right? So their experience is radically different than our experiences. So when they say unto you, shouldn't religion be spiritual and not political? They are betraying their understanding of religion. And to correct it is a far deeper issue because it goes back to groupthink. It goes back to what you're comfortable with, right? But one of the ways we correct it, and I'm very blunt when I speak to them, I say, well, most of Christianity has preached that as an ideal, but they have not only never lived up to it, but in human history, they have been the most colonizing and the most war-filled empire that history has ever seen. It was Christianity that went and colonized the entire world, even though they think they're supposed to be. So what good did that do them? On the contrary, it did no good at all. So you, you are, it's a very valid question. And the response, once again, it goes back to my paradigms. If in their minds, the ideal prophet is Jesus Christ, who's going to be dragged and, and crucified rather than put up a fight, you're going to have difficulty defending Moses, Solomon, David, our Prophet Wasallam. If it's an actual Christian, and here's another problem, guys, people, Muslims, Christianity is almost gone from this country. To bring forth didat arguments and, and Christian arguments, we are showing we are antiquated. You can't bring David did this and Solomon did this. They don't respect David and Solomon either. They're gone. They don't expect, respect the biblical prophets. These are agnostics. They're atheists. They're saying, your prophet is meant to be an ideal role model. You say Solomon killed a million people. He's going to say, so what? I don't agree with him either. No point quoting Solomon and David. Doesn't matter. They have a different paradigm. Even in their secular liberalism, even in their atheism, their Christianity is betrayed when they say, a religious person should be spiritual, not political. Who told you that? Where'd you get it from? If our Prophet were not political, we would not be Muslim right now. Brutally honest. We would not be Muslim right now. If it was just a spirit, that's why we're Muslim. Islam, and that's why, again, people are going to say it's a double standard. Of course it is. I mean, yeah, it is. When you do something for the truth, you do it for the truth. When you do it for batil, you do it for batil. There is clearly a quote-unquote double standards. When we went and quote-unquote colonized because we did that, it was for the betterment of mankind. It is for the betterment of mankind. I, again, I say this. I thank Allah for Muhammad ibn Qasim. What did Muhammad ibn Qasim do? He colonized us, right? Arabs should thank Allah for Amr ibn As. They, we thank Allah for the people who went out and did it. They're, they're going to say it's a double standard. We say, yeah, there is. I mean, that's what I say. Yeah, there is. It's for the truth now. I'm not suggesting you say that, but I have my philosophy of just being brutally honest and say, yes, if it is for the truth, and it is the truth, Islam is the truth. We don't be wishy-washy about this, right? So I don't know if I answered your question or confused you or your audience more, but like I said, sister, you have to already be sympathetic. Otherwise, no answer is going to be satisfying. So that's the second question. Okay, the third question. The third question isn't it obvious, they say, they say, that your prophet was either possessed by the devil, Christians would say, or crazy? Now, you can email me two separate questions, crazy or possessed by the devil. In fact, they're the same thing. If you're a Christian, you'll say devil. If you're an agnostic or atheist, you'll say megalomaniac or crazy. It's the same thing, really. So I put them all together. And they say that the founder of your religion was not a sane person. Now, this is a common slur that actually we, we have documented. It originates in the Crusades, or slightly earlier than the Crusades. And obviously, I mean, obviously it's kufr for us, but we understand what they're saying. It's, we, we would say the same thing. When somebody from India 150 years ago claimed to be a prophet, 
we automatically blame shaitan and the British. They're the same thing. But anyway, we blame shaitan and the British, right? Of course we did. Why shouldn't we? That's how we are. And it's complete sense. So what do you expect another faith who believes in Jesus to view? I mean, it's not just our prophet. They say the same about this guy in um, Utah, um, or, um, Joseph Smith. They say the same thing. I mean, we expect them to say that even as we hate it and we know that's kufr. What else do you expect them to say? That's their religion. That this person is not coming from God. So what they say is understandable even as we balk at it and hate it and despise it. And it's a common slur that goes back to the very beginnings of uh, Christian-Muslim relations. And the response once again, how do you respond? How do you respond to a person who genuinely believes Jesus to be his Lord and Savior and then he finds Islam says Jesus is not our Lord and Savior? This person will say this ideology must be coming from the devil. Do you not understand that he has from his paradigm a watertight argument? Do you not understand that? This is a matter of faith. It's as simple as that. The fact of the matter is, from his perspective, how else is he going to justify this? It's clearly not coming from God. So we have to take a step back. And by the way, and again, you can say all you want. Say, oh, Islam preaches morality. Islam preaches to treat your parents nicely. Islam preaches. And the hardcore Christian will say, but Islam does not preach. What? That Jesus is the son of God. And that to them is our equivalent of shirk. Correct? If you come across a Mormon who is not drinking alcohol and he says to you, oh, my prophet also said don't drink alcohol. Are you going to say, oh, mashallah, mashallah, great, let's shake hands. Or are you going to say, doesn't matter, your prophet was inspired by the devil. You see? What are you going to say? So my point is, what else do you expect them to say? That's Christian theology. You're not going to win them over by anything other than appealing to the fitra and tawheed. Again, the spiritual paradigm shift. In other words, sorry to be so blunt, there is no answer to this actual point other than theology. La ilaha illallah versus the Trinity. That's the answer here. As long as they believe in the Trinity, there is nothing you can say to them. And I've spoken and debated with plenty of Christians. What else do you expect them to say? Now, speaking with an agnostic who says, A'udhu Billahi was crazy, is actually easier. And by the way, most agnostics don't say that. Most modern atheists and all don't say that. Um, they don't have any problem uh, saying that he was a genius in his own way. They have no problem saying that. He was a great leader in his own way for his own people. I've had agnostics say that to me. I don't have any problem, they would say, acknowledging him to be a great leader for his time. But don't tell me he's a leader for all of mankind because of da-da-da-da. So that's very common to say that. As for the claim that, A'udhu Billah, he was... Uh, yani mentally unstable this is pretty easy to refute and that is that no one ever accused him of being mentally unstable he lived a very stable life in every facet from being a leader to being a family man to being a friend you can't just be unstable in one aspect and mentally stable in every other facet of life no one felt he was mentally unstable so and and to be honest nobody really says this of intelligence i mean as far as i know this is now a gone deal but the issue of the prophet yani, uh, uh not being mentally normal this is something very easy to respond to and as for the claim that he was inspired by by the devil in my humble opinion this is a matter of theology we would expect a person of a Christian background to say this because from their perspective that is what the devil would want somebody to do and the devil will make Islam beautiful by saying certain good things but the most important thing which is Jesus Christ is going to be absent just like we would say the same to any other tradition that we uh, disagreed with so in my humble opinion I would say this is something there's no point even talking about directly. You got to go indirectly and talk about Tawheed versus Trinity. That's what you need to do. Get to the crux of the matter, which is, is there one God or are there three gods? Is Jesus the Son of God? That's what you need to get into. Once a person believes there's one God, then the whole issue of the devil inspiring the process is automatically going to be uh, gotten rid of. And Allah knows best. So that's number three. And four, I just put it in one number three. Number four in my list, number four is again one of the most common ones that we get. And 
This is the awkward one of the age of Aisha and the P word. You all know the P word, no need for me to say it. And we all love the process of too much to say that word. I don't like using the word, it's not dignified. But anyway, the, the issue of the age of Aisha, right? You all know, guys, everybody knows what we're talking about here. You all know the P word as well, because I want you to know it in case of actual da'wah. Yes? Anybody that doesn't, doesn't know Talha will tell you. The guy in the back doesn't know. You can tell him later on, inshallah. Okay. Um, and it's not—it's not a problem if you don't know. But just find out what it is, so that you, when you hear it, you know that uh, this is the word. Okay. How do we respond to this? If you know Sira lectures, you know that I—it's a pet peeve of mine. I—I I cringe when Muslims want to go back and reinvent history. I don't like this at all. The claim that Aisha was miraculously 18, mashallah, tabarakallah, which just so happens to be the legal age of consent in modern America, mashallah, what a coincidence, mashallah, tabarakallah. I cringe. Really, I cringe. And I guarantee you, in 20, 30 years, when the age of consent will be 19, these same people will raise it up by one year, and as the political correctness goes, so too they're going to rediscover history. That's not the way forward. That's not the way forward. So, in my humble opinion, when this accusation comes of the Prophet being this P word or marrying Aisha, firstly, we have to be fair and acknowledge this is one of those things where the Abu Bakr paradigm, being sympathetic and finding an excuse versus the non-Muslim paradigm. Let's be brutally honest here. Maybe some of us would find this in another leader to be something not worthy of emul uh, emulation. But because of our iman, alhamdulillah, because of our iman, we have no problem with it. So when we acknowledge that, we realize some things are not necessarily fully defensible from an intellectual standpoint. But we can try. I'm not saying give up. But I'm saying realize there is a huge bias issue at play here, which is no problem. Alhamdulillah, our iman is so strong. We can, but I say this, and again, I'm sorry, dear Muslims, if you came to this class thinking that I would just sanitize and romanticize everything, but I'm a pragmatic person. I don't teach fairy tales. I don't give you ideas that are false. If I were to tell you something, to make you feel good now. Then you actually try it in the real world and find out that it never works. Never. I mean never. I think I failed in my job to be your teacher. That's not me. Brutal honesty. You are not going to convince anybody from that paradigm that this is morally acceptable. Brutal honesty. They might excuse it that, okay, it was okay for that time and place. They might, that's the max you can do. But see, we keep on saying he wasn't just meant for that time and place. We keep on saying he was a role model for all of mankind. And that's where even the most open-minded amongst them get stuck. That's where they balk at. So you can go down two or three routes, but in the end of the day, faith has a lot to do with this. You can go down the historical route. What is the historical route? You quote example after example of child marriages. You can do that. Okay? You can quote, and I have uh, from my previous notes, I have a number of them. Uh, where is it? Isabella, daughter of the King of France, was eight years old when Richard II of England married her. So here we have an eight year old child. Baldwin III, King of Jerusalem, during the Crusades, married the niece of the Byzantine Empire when she was 12 years old. Okay, And I have a whole long list that I can go over one after the actual authentic references. And then I'll even give you some history for your own information, just FYI. When did this become an issue in America? Why in this country is almost every state talking about 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old marriages up until this decade by the way still up until this decade the age of marriage in many states was 12, 13, 14 why and when did this change? believe it or not this marriage law was only codified around 100 years ago in this land when and I'll tell you some history just FYI you should all know this stuff around 100 years ago what year is it now? what year is it? 
2019, right? Okay, I get loose to track of time sometimes. 2019, okay, we're in 2019 in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, right? East Plano. East Plano, Jazakallah Khair. Okay, yeah. Uh, where was I? 1920. 1920s America. A very famous scandal happened. Very famous. It became the talk of the world or the talk of the, the country. A very, very wealthy multimillionaire, like somebody of the Rockefeller type of, not a Rockefeller, but somebody of that social circus in, in, in his 50s, publicly advertised that he wanted essentially a child bride. Okay, he wanted a young bride. And he's advertised. It was legal. There's no, no law against it, right? And, you know, young girls across the country are applying because this is multi, Mr. Multibillionaire, whatever. And finally, he ends up marrying a 14 or 15 year old. I forgot now, okay? And he was like 55, 60 years old. And he marries like a 14 year old. It was legal. There are no laws against this at that time. Obviously, it's 1920. I mean, they're no longer in 1820. It's 1920. They can't be that uncivilized. Talk, talk, talk. Blah, 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 blah. Finally, legislation is passed. Legislation across the country that there should be a minimal age. But it's still 1920 and not 2019. So what age do most states come? 12, 13, 14. Because it's 1920. Some states 15, very rarely. So the default back then 100 years ago was essentially puberty because 12, 13 is when you become puberty, right? 12, 13 when you should get married. That's the average age of marriage. So you can go down the historical route. But what is the problem going down the historical route? Who can tell me? I've already betrayed the problem, but who can tell me? Yes, go ahead. I know you want to raise your hand. Go ahead. Exactly. So what if it happened a hundred years ago? Your prophet is not meant to be something of the past. That's the whole point. You can quote me a million examples. You are telling me that he is meant to be rahmatan lil alameen, not just for Medina of the seventh century. And and then they have done this, and I've had this, and maybe you will as well. Would you marry your nine year old daughter to a fifty seven year old man? And let's be brutally honest. Would you? I wouldn't. I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to in this day and age. It's not going to happen. So hence my point. You can mention this. Now, you can also go down. So this is the historical route. You're going to get to a dead end. There's the other route to go down. And that is the biological route, which is also fine. You can quote science. And this is true. You can. Science has documented ever since people began recording ages and, you know, statistics and whatnot. It is a fact that the age of puberty has gone up in the last 120 years, ever since they began documenting everything, statistics, body sizes, everything. You know, like the, that's what civilization does. One of the markers of a civilization, it records its records. And people that are not civilized, they or don't have that civilized, there's no records going on. H hence why all of our great-grandparents are always born the 1st of January of that year, because they didn't care about the dates and times. Anyway, why am I talking about this stuff? So the point is that... The point is that what? Huh? Biology. Biology tells us, without a doubt, that puberty has risen by around a month every year for the last so many years, right? So the average age of puberty 100 years ago was much before it is now. Therefore, extrapolating back 1,400 years, we say, what's the problem? And, and, and that's Aisha, when she reached puberty, she reached puberty at the age of nine, by the way. That's the whole point. Why did she wait till nine? Why did the marriage consummate at nine? Because that's when the menses set in, in her case, right? Now, in our time, nine is not the typical age of menses. It's 11, 12, that's not the typical age. Nine, it still happens, but it's not the typical age. So the point is, we can go down this route, but once, and, and we can say, and we can contextualize, it varies from culture to culture and time to time and place to place, and that's fine. We can also say, even the worst critic of the Prophet ﷺ at that time frame did not find it problematic, and that's true. That is absolutely true. That even those who rejected Islam, for them this was no big deal. It's not something on their register, register as being abnormal or immoral. That is all true. But like I said, at this stage, you're preaching to your own paradigm. 
So we have to be honest enough to acknowledge that. You know what? I understand you're going to find this problematic. The only thing I go with is, is this, and that is that, look, it was a different time and place, and our religion does not say that this is, needs to be uh, resurrected now. And I say this, that in our modern uh, fiqh, we are allowed to put a higher age limit and leave it at that. There's not much more you can do in this regard. And again, this is my brutal honesty. I mean, if you feel otherwise, then best of luck to you. May Allah make it easier for you. I don't think you can really go beyond either the historical or the contextual and then leave it at that. This either appeals to you or not. And in the end of the day, you either sympathize with this individual and find excuses as we do, or you don't, in which case you're not going to. How else are you going to rationalize this? Because again, let's be honest here, because they do ask you this question. Would you do it now? Would you? You all know the answer to that. So, now by the way, one could say, if I found somebody like you know, the Prophet system, I would do that, okay? And that's a valid answer. Nobody can deny that. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed, but as I said, as I said, at this stage you're preaching to the choir because they will say he abolished slavery, did he not? Yes? <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> that was another problem that is not on the thing. Uh, I could say, let's not talk about that example. Slavery is tomorrow, by the way. Please, everybody come to Jonathan Brown's lecture tomorrow for Maghrib and Isha. That should be interesting, inshallah. They would say he abolished not slavery, but uh, alcohol, right? If he could have abolished alcohol, which was endemic, why couldn't he have also shown us what age group to marry? So why are you contextualizing one and not the other? And that's what I'm saying. You are preaching to the choir at this stage. The only people that will fully be convinced by this are those that are already, and it does work amongst our own youth that are a little bit confusing, uh, confused, <laughs> maybe they're confusing as well. Uh, it will work for them, no problem. Inshallah, they have some iman, they'll understand, okay, I understand that. But in my humble opinion, somebody who has already rejected is not going to be convinced by these issues. That's my analysis and Allah knows best, okay? Yes, brother in the back, yes. Okay, uh, your, your voice is not coming to me, sorry. All of these are valid answers. In fact, I also add another thing here, which I didn't have in my list, but I can add it here now. You seem to be concerned about her age. She was never concerned. She never complained. She lived another 50 years. She never found it problematic. She had nothing but the fondest memories. Are you going to care about her more than she cared about herself? More than her own parents? More than her own cu culture? And no. So who are you to come and impose your culture right, onto a previous civilization and culture? So we can reverse it around. And again, all of these are valid. I'm not saying they're invalid. I still say you must already have some sympathy to this individual or paradigm. Yes, go ahead. So the brother is saying, should we bring up gender roles and the role of the husband and wife? Uh, if you want to debate another five hours, yes, you may do that, okay? Because it's a whole different tangent altogether. But yes, it is also true um, that you wanted to make sure that your daughter would marry the most suitable and qualified man. That is her best chance of survival. And who better than the Prophet ﷺ from every aspect? That's why we thank Abu Bakr for his wise decision. We thank the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha. They all got along fine. Of course, that's true. But who's going to believe that? Only those who are already sympathetic to the paradigm. So again, we're kind of going in that infinite loop here. So point number five here. Issue number five. 
the highly problematic massacre of the Banu Quraida. This is one of those issues of the seerah where we get a lot of back and forth. The massacre of 700 people from the tribe of Banu Quraida, right? And of course, yani, the details are gruesome. Of course they are. You don't kill 700 people except with gruesome details. I mean, that's the reality. Go read our own books. They're not inventing these facts. And again, well, let me, let me ask you guys. And again, guys, let's be honest here. Everything you say, will it really work on somebody who's already rejected Islam? Or will it work to those who already have a soft spot for Islam and just need a little bit of push, which is our kids? Think This is what I'm asking you all. Be practical. All that you're going to say is only useful for those who have some iman or are very close to Islam. As for those who are looking at it from a different perspective, the IRA versus the British, right? The French resistance versus the not. It depends on which side of the aisle you're on. We are on the Islam aisle. Alhamdulillah for that. Alhamdulillah. We're on the side of Islam. So everything is justified. It makes complete sense to us. But what do you expect the Bani Israel of our times to look at? What do you expect them to do? I mean, we do the same when... Uh, look, look, guys, let's look at Andalus. Let's look at Andalus when we were expelled from Andalus. Right? Whose side are we on in that battle? Who are we sympathetic to? The Spanish are saying, hey, we had to purify our country. We had to make sure only us are there. We had to expel you guys. Whose side are we on there? On the people who were expelled. So let's be fair here and, and understand in the end of the day, group think, inbreed biases. We have our own paradigm. They have their paradigm. So I'm already telling you my answer to this. There is no answer. But anyway, let's hear your answer for those who are on the fence. Those who are already sympathetic to our paradigm. What is our answer? What do we say to the Banu Quraida? And there are things to be said to those people. No problem. What can be said? Number one, guys. They are a bunch of traitors. I mean, what more do you want? They did the biggest crime known to any political system. No sympathy. What did the, any society... Now we can give you a million examples. What do you do to traitors in your ranks? Every society does this. And at the most sensitive time. So why defend it when there is no need to catch, to sugarcoat it? It is what it is. That's exactly what it is. Everybody does this. You summar summarily execute traitors at times of war. In fact, our Prophet did not do that. He did not summarily execute them. He surrounded them. This is point number two, by the way. This also needs to be said. If you want to talk to somebody within our own paradigm and they're already sympathetic, in his generosity, he said to them, you tell me what should I do? And they said, choose another judge, not you. You should all know this from the seerah. So he said, who do you recommend? They said, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqa'ah. Sa no, I mean, uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, okay? So, who chose their own judge? They did. Not the Prophet ﷺ. They were the ones who chose their arbitrator. They felt, and Sa'ad and them were close buddies and friends. Sa'ad was their homeboy, mashallah, right? Sa'ad was their guy. Sa'ad was their buddy from back in the day. They felt, he's going to take care of us. So, the process didn't pronounce the verdict. This is a very key point. By the way, even if he did, we would have defended it. I have no problem with me, but I'm saying he didn't. In this case, he didn't. He did not pronounce that verdict. It was the people whom they chose. And the Prophet had no say because Sa'ad, the famous story, the famous story that when he came and he was, of course, uh, sick and dying, as you know the story, you should all know the story. He was bleeding to death and he came on a camel, not on a camel, he came on a donkey. And uh, the Prophet said to the Ansar, stand up to greet your leader, stand up to greet him, show him honor, he's coming in this state. So they all stood up to greet him. Uh, ila sayyidikum. Uh, and uh, the Banu Qurayda were on one side and the Prophet was on the other side. So he said to the Banu Qurayda, do you agree 
that you will listen to my verdict without any question like this is binding on you and they said yes and on the other side was the Prophet Sallallahu and he couldn't say do you agree that my verdict is going to be binding he couldn't say that so he looked down at the Prophet Sallallahu and he said and the other side is also in agreement like the adab that he had right at-taraf al-akhar is the other side in agreement and subhanallah the iman of sad right like he's looking straight and go do you agree i'm the judge yes the other side is also in agreement and the prophet said yes then sad said in that case my verdict is as follows and he gave the verdict everyone who is an adult male shall be executed and the prophet then said your judgment o sad is the judgment of Allah from above the seven heavens meaning this is what Allah wanted and you're the one who said it on your tongue not from me not from Allah Allah used you to say this verdict your verdict is the verdict from the seven heavens means you have done right but who chose Sa'ad they did so and, and by the way again the Torah the Injil every Qanun of the world it has the same verdict for traitors these were traitors at the most now the response goes, oh, but not everybody, you know, uh, agreed to this. There's a bunch of, 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 you know, teenagers in there. And the response is, that was the law of the time. Again, you are your group, your people. Your people betrayed and you went with them. You could have walked away. And I mentioned in my seerah lessons, if you listen to it, I hope you guys listen to that seerah and some seerah. I mentioned in my seerah, three of the Yahud were not executed. Three of them. Because they vocally protested. And they did not participate. And they said, this is treachery. This is a key point that you can mention here. Those who did not agree to this and they walked away, they were spared. And they were not killed. So the fact that they all agreed to betray Islam at such a sensitive time, they deserved what they did got. And again, I don't have any problem. And if they don't agree, I fully understand. What do you expect? We would not agree on the other side as well. Like I said, Spanish expulsion, and there were deaths, and there was persecution. To this day, some Spaniards justify it. And to this day, our hearts are with the other side. That is what happens in war. You sympathize with your people, and you don't sympathize with the, with the other side. So we say we can try to contextualize we can try to do that and at the end of the day we say the message needed to be sent don't mess with the muslims don't betray the muslims you need to send a message that nobody else should do this and the message was loud and clear and the message was needed and i have no problems with that so that's i don't have anything else to add you have anything else to add to this yes go ahead Yeah, I mentioned this. The Torah has this as well. Yes, I mentioned that. You can add this. Yes. Mentioned this as well. It's the law of the land across the world. Treachery and treason. Mm -hmm. Execution. And that's why, for example, if you look at even uh, um, the amount of hatred that they had against uh, John Walker Lind and all of these guys, right? Uh, you know, John Walker Lind and, and, and others of that persuasion. Uh, and, and anybody who joins you know, these groups from the you know, uh, converts who end up joining them or whatnot, look at the, the statements that you find people. And again, look at what's happening. Uh, and again, the, use these examples to make them understand. Europeans who joined uh, those groups, the so-called Daesh, most countries have stripped them of their citizenship. And the most famous case is uh, the British girl, Shamina, Shazina, what's her name? Uh, the British girl uh, who has no other nationality other than England, right? And the home office said the fact that she joined that group, she's going to go back to her, she's, her ancestors of Bangla, Bangladeshi. So she got the, uh, the British government says she has to go back there. And Bangladesh said she's never been a British, Bangladesh, a Bengali citizen. How can we give her citizenship? So she has been stripped of her citizenship simply because she joined that organization. The hatred, the whole country, the prime minister, uh, everybody is unanimous. We are not going to give her citizenship back, even though 
from a technical perspective, no matter what she has done, she is a citizen of that land she was born in. Go ahead and try her. Go ahead and execute her. She is your citizen. But the level of hatred and whatnot, because this happened, so you bring up these issues. Everybody does it. It's understood. Those whom you view as traitors, this is their verdict. They become citizenless. They are completely strapped away. Look at these... Um, Anyway, I don't want to go too explicit because it's problematic giving these examples in a mosque and whoever is going to report to whoever their boss is. Just, I'm giving these examples for i'tibar and not for, for what you call it. Anyway, so these are all you can say about this point number five. Point number six. What time do I have to finish, Talha? Uh, five. Ten minutes left. Point number six. And this is the standard canard. Goes back to the goes back to the Crusades and before the Crusades. And the first person to actually use this, in fact, was one of the priests of uh, Damascus who, uh, when Islam came to Damascus, this is in the 8th century, one of the first person to ever say this was a priest who said, their prophet, a'udhu billah, is a sensual man who has many, many wives. What do you expect a guy who's never touched a woman in his life to say about a prophet? I mean, let's be honest here. This is where it comes from. These people don't even have the halal, so of course they're going to be jealous of what our process has. What do you expect? And their priests have always said this throughout centuries. That's the reality. What do you expect them to do? And other than the Roman Catholic Church, is a whole different point. But the point is that this has been a standard canard that goes back 1,200, 1,300 years. Okay? Oh, he has multiple wives. And it is ironic that priests say this because of their own lifestyles, number one. And number two, because as priests, they're supposed to believe in David and Solomon. They're supposed to believe their own prophets had thousands of wives and concubines. Why is it problematic for the process to have 11 or 9 or whatever? But nonetheless, they bring forth uh, uh, this issue. Now, guys... How many of you have actually listened to my Mother of the Believer series? I'm just curious. Less than 2%, 3%. This is problematic then. Because I'm assuming most of you are still on your Sunday school two, two seconds now sound bites in which you will say, oh, but every marriage had a political goal to it. And if you're on that sound bite, then what I'm about to say is going to be not only over your head, but it will hurt and irritate you. Listen to my mother of the believers. That's all I can say. Listen to my series on the mother of the believers. It's a 20, 25 part series about all of our mothers. I went into a lot of detail. And please do not ever say that, oh, the Prophet only married them for political reasons. Because the minute you do, if they are complete jahil, they'll be quiet. But then they're going to go back to their teachers and their mentors. Or the biggest sheikh of all, sheikh, Google. And within 10 seconds, they will decimate you and destroy you. And you will be left embarrassed because you made a fool of yourself. Please, educate yourself. Be very careful. If you want to enter the realm of da'wah in modern times, this intellectual da'wah, please make sure you know your stuff. Or else just be quiet and preach Islam through your actions, which is far more easier and far better. Preach Islam through your akhlaq and through your ibadah and through your sakina. If you want to enter this realm of intellectual debates, you had better study and read non-stop. And be willing to change a lot of your ideas that you were taught in Sunday school. I don't want to say too much because if you haven't done this, then let me just say it's simply not true. Not true at all. That every marriage had a political issue. And I think the only way to do this is really just to say this is a blessing that Allah gave him and he deserved it. End of story. He is the best human being ever to walk the face of this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him what he didn't allow anybody else. He deserved it. That's what I believe. And it makes complete sense. I have no problem with that. Now the minute you try to justify, the minute you try to preach something contrary to the truth, and somebody just reads Sahih Bukhari, not even Ibn Hisham. Just reads the most basic books that we are not taught in Sunday school. Because again, if you listen to my seerah, we are taught to sanitize version of the seerah. We're not taught the raw seerah. And again, that's another problem altogether. But what's wrong with it? Yes, he did. So what? Allah tested him in ways that we don't want to be tested. And Allah blessed him in ways as well. He deserved it. So what? 
Leave it at that. Once you have love for somebody, you'll justify everything. Once you know Allah chose him, yes, Allah says in the Quran, this concession to marry multiple women, laka min dunil mu'minin. It's in the Quran. Qad alimna ma farad. We know what we have made fard for them. Allah is saying, I know what has been made fard for them, and I know what I've allowed for you. Ya Rasulullah, I've allowed for you what I haven't allowed for anybody else. This is in the Quran. Why don't we accept Allah's gift to the Prophet? Our problem comes, and again, I don't want to say too much because, again, this is very. Uh, if you haven't done my seerah or my wise of the mothers of the believers, then this is, this is too much information in two seconds overload. But we have to rethink through how we have constructed the image of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And enough said for that. There is nothing to defend here. There's no problem in the first place. That's my point. There's nothing awkward. Allah gifted him. He deserved it. If anybody deserved it, he did. And he deserved it. So I don't even see this as anything worth talking about in the first place. And then we can say, if you want to, we can say, that there are also benefits that came with all of this. Now, there is a big difference between saying the reason he was allowed all of these wives was because of these political benefits. That's wrong. It's just wrong. We don't have time to go into why it's wrong. Listen to my mothers or the believers, you will see why it's wrong. What we can say, Allah gifted him a gift. And that gift, if anybody deserved it, he did. And that gift did have some benefits to it of a tangible nature that we can see. And of those benefits, the preservation of his private life, hadith, about what he did in his house. We have so much information from all of the mothers that we have. We also have no doubt about it. In some cases, there were alliances with tribes that did, not in every case. Maimuna is the obvious example here, but she's one example, right? Juwaidia is another example, but these are the exceptions, not every single one. What happened with Juwaidia and the freeing of the tribe, but didn't happen with every one of them. But we can use it and say there were political perks that came. And I think in my humble opinion, definitely the miracle of miracles, most of us in this audience, we have, alhamdulillah, yani one wife. Some of us have none. We're struggling to get someone. But may Allah make it easy for those of you that are looking, inshallah. And as all of us who have one wife know, to get the admiration of one woman, hmm, how possible is it? Our brother says zero percent. <laughs> I hope your wife's not sitting here, brother. Okay. <laughs> Uh, or you're single, I don't know, are you single? Okay, <laughs> let's not say 0%, let's say at least 1%, right? There's something there. To get the admiration of one woman, how difficult is it? It's not easy, right? It's not easy. Wallahi, I say, wallahi, I say in all seriousness, the fact that all of our mothers genuinely admired him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam genuinely loved him genuinely respected him and we can't even with one woman we can't get to that level right and he had so many wives and all of them had nothing but the utmost admiration that is a miracle well it's a miracle that doesn't happen anywhere else anywhere when allah revealed in the quran go give them the choice i'll divorce you and give you the world or stay with me and live difficult lives. How many chose divorce and to be given the world? How many? Zero. That's the miracle there. Why do we have to be embarrassed about it? What is there to be covering up about? That's the miracle right there. That's exactly the raw iman that our kids need to hear. Don't be embarrassed. Yes, our process went through a lot of difficulty. He lost both parents. He lost uncles and grandfathers. He lost his children, every child he buried. He lost so many people. So what if Allah made the world easy for him in one aspect and gave him loving wives? So what? Why do you have to be embarrassed about that? What is there to be? Was, this is a blessing Allah gifted him. He deserved it if anybody deserved it. So stop getting awkward and embarrassed over something that doesn't need to be embarrassed about. Allah says in the Quran, I'm allowing this for you, not for anybody else. This is explicit in the Quran. End of story. Now who's going to understand this? Somebody who already has the open-mindedness and the belief 
that this person is a great person. We understand somebody outside is going to say double standards. Of course they're going to say, we would say the same thing when we look at their cults and their false religions and we say their leader does this and he does that. We would say the same thing to them. So let's be honest here. When there's a cult and the leader does whatever he does, right? And the rest of them don't do that. We're going to say the same thing. It's all the matter of that inbreed bias versus group thing versus... That's human nature. So... I don't find any problem with this issue and we say that in my humble opinion I would not talk about this issue at all if they bring it up we say well we believe that he was somebody who suffered so much that our Lord gave him this concession and you have to see why we believe this way by the way I forgot to mention one point it's a very important point I was going to say it at the end but I can say it now anytime these issues are raised all of these seven eight nine issues anytime they're raised Pivot them into why we admire this man and why we believe in the faith. Rather than spending half an hour talking about the wives of the Prophet, talking about the Banu Quraida, waste of time. Give the two second response and then say, But you know what? For me, that's not how I view our Prophet. That's not what I think of when I think of him. Do you want to know why? Now you get into the our paradigm, the Abu Bakr model, the Iman model, and you talk about Allah and the Quran and the Messenger and all of the positive of Islam, and then hope and pray that something you said attaches to his fitrah and he starts getting more curious. That's all you can do. And again, here's another point. I know it's getting almost to the end. Why do Muslims violently defend the honor of the Prophet ﷺ so many times? Why do they get violent when they want to defend in their love? Okay, this is the question Ikna asked me. <laughs> um, interesting question, don't you think? You tell me, why do you get violent, guys? <laughs> How do you respond to this question? Why do people, the Charlie Abdo case and this case and that case, and it's mutawatir across the globe, right? I mean, it's not just a one-off, right? These non-Muslims say, what is it about your prophet that causes your people to go berserk? That's the question they ask. What do you guys say? Yes. This is obviously, it's a valid point. And again, you're preaching to the choir because you call it love. What will they call it? Exactly. Let's be honest here. Stop beating around the bush. You call it love. I call it love. What do they call it? So let's be fair here. But you're right. Excessive love does lead. Now, I would phrase it this way. Excessive love occasionally leads to fanaticism. I say this way. It's the truth. What else do we want to say? Sisters, you've been exceptionally quiet, huh? They're what? The Muslims are embarrassed? Okay. Okay, so an incompetence in how to answer, this is a true point psychologically. You resort to violence when you don't know how to respond intellectually. This is a valid point, okay? What else do we say? You're missing actually far bigger points. Yes? So again, the excessive love, people easily be become violent when uh, they value something excessively so they'll do that yes e, that's a very iffy 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 thing generally speaking those who end up joining and doing these types of things are generally educated people generally speaking sometimes maybe in the Charlie Abdo case they weren't but generally speaking they're middle to upper middle class yes Oh, never, never, ever, ever do that. When's the last time you heard somebody go blow himself up because somebody made fun of the Holocaust? No, that's exactly what I'm saying. I know you're not saying that. I'm saying that. Never give that example. Never. Scrap it from the record. It works against you. They have no problem with you getting offended. They have a problem with you going killing people, which is what they're asking. They don't mind you get offended. You have every right to be offended. They'll get offended if you make fun of their mothers. There's the mothers, there's no problem. They're going to say you have the right to be offended. But if you look around the world, it's not offense. It's violence and killing. It's attacking people. It's sh bombs. That's the issue. Be angry. You don't have to kill people. 
How can I be excessive? Whoa, guys, طلع, keep him in check, man. Rain him back. Be careful. Make sure his passport's with you. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Just place. Excellent. You can bring in statistics, Gallup polls. Excellent. The vast majority of Muslims condemn it. There's still a big point to be mentioned. Yes. Valid point, but I think in my humble opinion you're missing the big, 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 big point. I'll mention it because time is limited. Muslims, especially in these lands, are already a disenfranchised minority. They already have a lot of political pressure and tension on them. So their fuse is already short. This isn't a justification. It is a contextualization. Always say this. This is not a justification, it's a contextualization. If an already embattered, an already bitter, an already disenfranchised community that is being legislated against, that is being stereotyped, that is being mocked and ridiculed, is further subjugated to their most sacred icon being ridiculed in this manner, then no justification, but there is a provocation that will result in a backlash. And what you can do, and I've done this actually in public lectures, is to give an example that they can understand. That imagine uh, a racist you know, person or rich you know, uh, capitalist Wall Street banker, racist, well-known, walks into a neighborhood that is of a different skin color than he is, you get the point, stands on his Rolls Royce and begins insulting with the most vile terms using words that we're not going to mention at all but begin with the letter before M and you mention these uh, things, right? And he uses these words. Now, what's going to happen, we all know. Is it justified? No. But what has he done? He's provoked a group that's already embattered, embittered, already disenfranchised, already. So this is what is happening, that you have a group politically, media-wise, socially, they're on edge. Now you have somebody come and then provoke them even more. No justification, but there is a context from within which this is coming. It's going to backlash and come back and hit them. I always mention this as well. It's not a justification, it is reality. So inshallah with this... So that's a very valid point that uh, in Afghanistan something just happened was yesterday, right? And Pakistan it happens all the time, which I don't know, I'm a Pakistani as well. I don't understand what our qawm is, what's up with them. I have no clue what's going on. There's something in our blood, I don't know what it is. But I don't understand why would you want to go and blow up another masjid on Jumu'ah because of, it doesn't make any sense to me, you know? So the point is that you are absolutely correct that this notion of disenfranchised, nonetheless, that having been said, let me just push back a little and say, this did not happen a hundred years ago, did it? Even though non-Muslims did make fun of our process a hundred years ago. So what has happened in the mindset, even of modern-day Pakistan? What is going on? I would say it is overall this notion that we are being attacked from all sides. Whether it's true or not, but that's the notion. We're under siege. Everything's happening. And so when this last straw happens, they become so berserk and angry that this does happen. I do think modern politics plays a role in this. In the end of the day, all you can say is sometimes excessive love does lead to excessive fanaticism. And excessive love, when it's kept in check, is something that is healthy. When it's kept in check, you want to love your Prophet more than anything else. Wasallam, so there's nothing wrong with that. It's only excessive love. Anyway, to conclude, I hope I haven't done more damage than good. <laughs> we'll find out, inshallah. But you want me to come? I will not sugarcoat. I will preach what I feel is my experiences and whatnot. And I feel that uh, I would do a disservice if I weren't honest with you. So the last two, three hours have been a dose of my version of honesty. I hope that inshallah there was of some benefit. If not, you can blame Talha for 
inviting me and uh, and coming to Ikna for this event. I hope that inshallah, uh, any other questions you have, actually I'm in this community, so inshallah you can come to me. There's no time. Is there time? I don't know. What time is the adhan? Hmm? In three minutes. Go ahead, quickly go ahead. So the question is about the so-called satanic verses. Uh, and did you listen to my seerah lecture on that? No, you haven't. You should listen to that lecture and you will find the answer. We can flip it around and say the fact that Allah defended and the fact that there was a correction given indicates that it's not... Because even in the verse, حَتَّى إِذَا تَمَنَّى أَلْقَى الشَّيْطَانَ فِي أُمْنِيَتِهِ فَيَنْسَخُ اللَّهُ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانِ Allah will abrogate what comes from the shaytan. So this is something very clear that whatever comes from the shaytan will be abrogated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With this we really do need to conclude, you know, but in, sister, go. I don't want to make sure. One last question. Go ahead, sister. Last question. Bismillah. So the question is that in a male-dominated field, a sister, how does she give da'wah uh, you know, in this environment? And I go back to my first point. Da'wah is primarily given through your manners and your akhlaq and not through your speech. So embody the femininity of Islam through your haya and show them what it means to be a female Muslima in a male world through your gaze, through your modesty, through your dignified interactions and hope that inshallah ta'ala something clicks in their fitrah and inshallah, and by the way, I have a close friend of mine who converted because, or whose wife converted because of this issue of a sister's modesty so it's not going to be uh, something strange inshallah with this, jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال